All right, so we are continuing our discussion here of the chi-square distribution. Last video, we sort of got a glimpse into like what it does, what it's for, et cetera, in the context of that M&M &M problem. Here, we're going to start to formalize things a little more. So the official name for the test we were like working on in that M&M &M problem is called the chi-square goodness of fit test. Goodness of fit always throws me for a little bit of a loop. It doesn't sound to me grammatically correct, but it's totally what it's called. Sometimes you'll see goodness of fit abbreviated appropriately, GOF, G-O-F. So the chi-square goodness of fit test is a test that we use on a single categorical variable. So what is the chi-square goodness of fit test? It is going to be a test for one categorical variable with technically two or more choices or two or more possibilities, but really we want three or more possibilities. So what do I mean by that? When we did our M&M &M problem, our variable of interest was color. Color is categorical. It can be red or blue or yellow or green, or I forget what all the possibilities were. I think there were six of them in all, six possible choices. That would be a situation where you want a chi-square distribution. If I wanted to look at political affiliation, you can be a Democrat or a Republican or an independent or a libertarian or a Green Party member, blah, 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 all these different choices, categorical variable, lots of possibilities, boom, chi-square. This is related, in a sense, to a one-sample Z test for a proportion. When you do a proportion problem, proportion problems are categorical, but they have to be only two options. If I wanted to do a P problem on my M&Ms, I could do like red versus not red. I could do blue versus not blue. I could do primary color versus not primary color. If I was doing political affiliation, Democrat versus not Democrat, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can break it into two, two possibilities, but that's all you can do for P problems. If you've got a categorical variable with only two choices, like if it was just red versus blue or something like that, and that's all you could be, I probably would still just use P. I would do it like old chapters. You're really gonna use the chi-square distribution when you've got more than two possibilities. It could still work on a two variable or two possibility problem, but really you're gonna use chi-square goodness of fit when you have three or more options. The hypotheses on a chi-square problem are a bit weirder than what you usually would see. You're gonna wanna do it like I have written right here in blue, which actually, oops, involves doing it in words, not in symbols. So you're gonna do your hypotheses for these problems in words. Your null hypothesis would say in the M&M problem, the stated distribution that M&M has on their website is still correct for modern day M&Ms, something to that effect. And then your alternative would be, hey, the stated distribution on the m, &M website is no longer correct. It's not correct anymore. So you're basically just going to say, hey, what we said is correct or what they say is correct for HO. HA, what they said is not correct. You could attempt to do it in symbols like I have written down here in red. HO said, oh, the portion that are red is 13%, the portion that are brown are 13%, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it would not be correct to do what they're saying for HA down here, where the portion of red is not 13%, brown is not 13%, yellow is not 14%, and so on. If I just kept on doing not equals for each of my HA, that is saying they all would need to be different for my alternative. That doesn't have to be true. It could be that, hey, red is still the same, brown is still the same, but ooh, it's blue that's different. This one's supposed to be different, or oh, it's this one that's different right here. It's sort of a mix and match deal. If some of them were different, but not all of them, M&M would still be wrong on their websites. So that would still be cause for HA. If you write it with all not equal to, 
that doesn't say the same thing. That says they all need to be different, which isn't true. Basically, it's at least two of them that we would need to be not true. We need at least two of these to be different. It's confusing. It's better, honestly, to not even use symbols in the first place. It can be done if you say like at least two must be different, but we're not even going to worry about that. Just do it in words like I did on the left side in blue. Okay, so this is how you're going to state your hypotheses for a chi-square problem. HO, the stated distribution is correct. HA, it's not correct. It's just easier that way. So the chi-square test statistic itself, we talked in the last video, our symbol for that is going to be our fancy looking X squared right here. And the way that we found this again, we take what we got, our observed counts, minus our expected, we square it, we divide by what we expected to get a sense for how far off they are, and then we add all of those different quantities together. You can see right now my cat's there in the background, if you can see her, she's like over there, kind of cool. All right, so I've got my little counts right here, I'm adding all those up, and when I do that, I get a chi-square test statistic. So. That chi-square test statistic is based on the expected counts and the observed counts that we get for our problem. Couple comments on expected counts here. So you guys, just things to watch out for. First of all, as we saw in the m, &M problem, do not round your expected counts. Yes, it's not possible to have 6.5 red M&Ms like we said in the last video but that's still what's expected to happen. You cannot just turn those into whole numbers. When you do expected counts, you find them by taking the expected percents times your sample size. So like there were supposed to be 13% red M&Ms. I did 0.13 times my sample size of 50. That's how I got 6.5. You just take your percentages times your sample sizes. And when you're writing down your counts, you need to make sure you report the counts, not the percents. What do I mean by that? I was supposed to get, um, I think it was 13% red, but I got, I want to say it was five out of 50. I got 10%. So rather than comparing 13% to 10% and using percentages, you want to use the actual numbers from the problem. I got five red M&Ms. I was supposed to get 6.5. Use the raw numbers, not the percentages. If I say, oh, I only got 10% red, I don't get out of that piece of information how many there were supposed to be. I don't get a sense of my sample size or how much I was off by. Use the raw numbers or the counts, not the actual percentages. So let's keep it going there. In a chi-square goodness of fit test, when does the chi-square test statistic follow a chi-square distribution? We will get more into these conditions later, but this is like the conditions we're gonna have to check. The big thing that we're gonna establish for this video, all of our expected counts must be greater than or equal to five. I'm not gonna to try to justify that. So I'm just gonna give it to you as a rule right here. What does that mean? In my m, &M problem, I was supposed to have 6.5 red M&Ms. I was supposed to have like 10 orange. I don't remember all the specifics. But I had all those numbers I wrote down for what I was supposed to have. Those numbers need to be at least five or you can't do it. So like, let's say I was supposed to have purple M&Ms, but I was only supposed to get one of those for my expected. That's not big enough. That would not be okay. So all of your categories need to be at least size five for what you expect to happen in order for the chi-square distribution to work out right. Now, let's say I was supposed to get two purple and three pink or something like that. Those are too low. I could put those together and be like, oh, purple and pink, that's a category. So there are ways to fix it if you don't get enough expected, but you have to make sure all of your expected sizes are at least five. Notice that it is expected here, 
not observed. So it's what you're supposed to get. If you get less than five, like I think I got three reds or something like that, that's okay, as long as I was supposed to get at least five. And the degrees of freedom for a chi-square test, for a goodness of fit test, you're actually going to take, you might remember from t-test problems, it was sample size minus one. For chi-square problems, it's not going to be the sample size. It's going to be the number of categories minus one. So in my m and problem, I had six colors. I would take six minus one. There would be five degrees of freedom. It is not the sample size. It's your categories, the number of categories minus one. And then let's talk a little more about what the chi-squared distribution will actually look like. We saw that simulated dot plot in the last video. And what you should have seen is that the chi-squared distribution actually is not symmetric. It's not like the normal curve where it's the same on both sides. What you actually end up seeing for a traditional chi-squared distribution is actually something a little more skewed to the right. You can see how the shape changes on each of these distributions as the degrees of freedom get bigger. And it does seem the more categories you have, it does start to look more and more symmetric. You'll usually be in this blue green area right here where you see a fairly skewed to the right distribution. So the chi-square distribution is in fact skewed to the right. And I'm gonna give you a couple other quick pointers here about the chi-square distribution. These are things that are good to be familiar with. Ultimately, they won't come up that much though. And those two other things that I'm gonna have you guys write down with regards to this. First off, the mean of a chi-square distribution. The mean is where you would balance this thing on your finger so it would be equal weight on both sides. The mean occurs at the degrees of freedom, the number of degrees of freedom. So for my blue picture with three degrees of freedom, if I'm looking at that blue guy, the mean would fall. I'd want to put my finger right there to balance that blue picture on both sides. If I was doing my green picture, which appears to be five degrees of freedom, my finger would need to go right here to balance that guy out. And then the peak of your distribution occurs at the degrees of freedom minus two. So my blue picture, three degrees of freedom, the peak of that distribution occurs at one. My green one, five degrees of freedom, the peak occurs at three. These two, they'd be good for you to know. It certainly is helpful. Um, they're not hard to memorize, but those are things you should just be aware of. I may or may not ask you about those on a quiz or something like that. Okay, so we're going to see a right skewed distribution, which is new to us because everything else so far has been pretty symmetric. Now, the p-value for problems with chi-square are going to, first of all, we're going to talk about table in this video. Next video, I'll probably show you how to do it on the calculator. But when you look at a chart right here, what you'll need to do, we're always going to find the area to the right side. I think I'm mirrored here, so right is like this way. Um, so we want to find all of the values beyond what we get in the actual problem. So if you recall for our problem yesterday, I want to say our chi-square value was like 4.93 or something like that. And we wanted to know how rare it was. And it turns out that 4.9 ended up being somewhere in the middle of our picture, not very special. What I would do, I would look at five degrees of freedom because I have six categories and I would find the closest thing to my number here. A 4.9 doesn't even get me on this table right here. I would need at least a 6.63 for my test statistic. If you look, a 6.63 corresponds to a tail probability or a p-value already of 0.25. If I got like a over around an 11 test statistic, that'd be at 0.05, et cetera. So I can say with my 4.9, my p-value here is certainly over a 0.25. That's the best I can do. You won't get an exact number from using the table, but certainly it's above a 0.25. That's pretty big. So that would lead me to say, hey, I'm not sure that Eminem changed things. I wouldn't say, oh, it's definitely the same. I wouldn't accept HO. But I would say, ooh, I'm not sure if the test statistic, I don't have convincing evidence that there's a difference from what Eminem used to say. Okay, so that's how you would actually use one of those charts.
And then we're going to finish off this video by kind of looking at a fresh problem here and analyzing some stuff. So we've got Jenny here. Jenny's going to made a die out in her out of clay in her ceramics class, and she wants to roll this die to see if it's fair, where it lands on the same probability for each of the six different sides. So she does an experiment where she rolls this thing 60 times. And then she records what she ends up getting right here. So clearly she didn't get as many threes as she was supposed to. And she got like more ones than she was supposed to. So is the one side maybe a little heavier or lighter or something like that? Or was this just due to chance? This is an opportunity to use the chi-squared distribution. Our categorical variable is what side one through six shows up. So we've got six possibilities here. The hypotheses, if you want to pause, try to write those down. Remember for chi-square, we do this in words. So I'm going to write mine down, but pause yourself and try to set it up. All right, so I've got hypotheses written down there. Again, you say these in words. HO is the distribution is what it's supposed to be or what it's assumed to be. We go into the problem assuming nothing is up here, assuming status quo, her die is working like it's supposed to. All six sides are equally likely to occur. The word distribution is a wonderful word to have in your answer for your HO and HA. So use that word distribution somewhere in what you put down. And then HA, our alternative would be, hey, her die isn't doing what it's supposed to. All six sides are not equally likely. Don't worry about symbols and stuff like that. Just put it in words. It says, well, what's the evidence for HA? Why do we think HA might be true? That's going to involve those expected counts that we would need to calculate. Now, on our M&M &M problem, we were supposed to get different things for each one. So there was a little bit of work. This one, we're hoping her die is like equally likely for each side. Out of 60 possibilities, you would take a sixth for each of these. We would expect to see 10 for every single one this time. Equally likely for each side, 60 rolls total. Now, what's the evidence for HA? Well, the observed counts don't match. Or observed doesn't match the expected counts. If we had gotten tens the whole way down, well, clearly there's probably not an issue with her die. We do have some discrepancies here. It'll just be a sense, we'll just get a sense for like, are these discrepancies big enough? So first thing we're gonna do is calculate your test statistic. I did that for you in the last video because it was new with the M&Ms. Pause me and calculate your test statistic using our nice little formula, which again, went observed minus expected, you squared it, you divide by expected, you add them up. So do that and then find the p-value from our table from earlier. I will pause myself and come back with the answers. All right, so um, last time I did my test statistic calculation in table format, this time I tried to just do it like in little chunks with a formula here. I don't care which way you do it. That's a personal preference thing. If you're doing it, um, showing work for an exam or something like that, show me at least a couple terms here. These all end up getting divided by 10 because the expected is 10 for everything this time around. On the other problem, they would have been different because we had different expected counts. We get 3.4 for our test statistic. And if you go up, we're actually in the same row, still five degrees of freedom because we had six choices, six categories, minus one. And again, we don't even make it on the table. So this is a very similar conclusion to last time. We're not even a 6.63. We don't hit that 0.25. Our p-value is over 0.25. Don't know exactly what it is, but ultimately it doesn't matter because that's definitely going to be over whatever significance level we use. So we're going to end up failing to reject HO, meaning there's not convincing evidence that Jenny's die is messed up. There's not convincing evidence the distribution of outcomes on Jenny's die is unequal for all six sides. So not convincing evidence for HA. And for this problem here, if we did make an error, we failed to reject. That means we could be making a type two error. Next video, we're gonna clean up chi-square goodness of fit a little more, and I'm gonna show you how you can use your calculator to do some um, calculations.